Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality characteristics that may be at work in the Rodney Alcala case. Rodney Alcala was known as the dating game killer. He was convicted of seven murders and numerous other crimes. He was active from 1968 to 1979 it's likely he committed many more murders that he was not convicted for. Just a reminder here that I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a case like this. So first I'll take a look at Rodney's background, then his crimes, the mental health and personality factors, and then I'll offer a few thoughts specific to his appearance on the dating game. So now starting with his background, Rodney was born in 1943 in San Antonio, Texas. His father left the family in 1954, his mother moved him and his two sisters to Los Angeles. In 1960, he joined the Army, intending to be a paratrooper. He spent four years there as a clerk. After these four years, he went absent without leave and hitchhiked from Fort Bragg all the way to Los Angeles. It was reported he had a nervous breakdown. He was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, chronic severe. He was discharged from the Army at that time. After his discharge, he attended the UCLA School of Fine Arts, and this moves us to September 25, 1968. Rodney was 25 years old. At this time, he targeted an eight-year-old female victim. He lured her into his car with a photograph of her parents. He drove her back to his apartment in Los Angeles, then committed sexual assault and attempted murder. A witness had followed Rodney's vehicle and called the police. When the police arrived at his apartment, Rodney answered the door and told them to wait a moment because he was getting dressed. About a minute later, when the police finally kicked the door in, Rodney had escaped out the back door. I don't think many police officers these days would be fooled by the I'll be with you in a moment trick. If they were going to give a suspect a moment, I imagine they'd send one officer around to the back door. After Rodney's escape, he moved to New York City. Using an alias, John Berger, Rodney was accepted into New York University School of the Arts. He would graduate from that school in 1971. In that same year, and still using the alias, Rodney started working in Manhattan as a photographer. Most of his subjects were young women. So a side note here, I think this story really captures the relaxed disposition we see in the early 70s. The tendency then was to trust people. There was no internet search available. Credentials were easy to forge. It's likely no one even bothered to check to see if John Berger was Rodney's real name. He simply changed his name, went to school, and got a job after he graduated. It was really that simple back then. Moving to June 1971, we see that Rodney murders a 23-year-old female in her Manhattan apartment. Rodney wasn't connected to this crime until much later. Now, what led to his arrest for the attack on the girl was him being added to the FBI's 10 most wanted list. By the time this caught up with him, he was working as a counselor at a summer camp in New Hampshire. Two of the kids in that camp recognized him from a poster hanging in the local post office. Rodney was arrested and extradited to Los Angeles. He would eventually plead guilty to a lesser charge because the parents of that victim did not want her to testify. He was given an indeterminate sentence. This meant he would simply be released when it was safe to do so. A prison psychiatrist recommended his release in August 1974. Rodney manipulated mental health professionals with ease. Within a month, he was working as a photographer in Los Angeles. By October, he was arrested again, this time for kidnapping a 13-year-old female and selling marijuana. He went back to prison and would be released on June 16, 1977. He evidently impressed prison officials with his significant improvement. Rodney asked his parole officer for permission to travel to New York, and the parole officer granted it. This takes us to July 15, 1977. Rodney murdered a 23-year-old female in New York City. This victim, Ellen Jane Hover, was the goddaughter of both Dean Martin and Sammy Davis Jr., so he was not concerned about a high-profile target. By September, we see he gets a job working as a typesetter for the Los Angeles Times, right? So he moves from New York City back to Los Angeles and gets a job. October 8, 1977, Rodney murders a 19-year-old female in San Francisco, he was never convicted of this crime. November 9, 1977, Rodney kills in Hollywood Hills. This time the victim is an 18-year-old female. 
the cause of death, strangled with a pair of pants, and blunt force trauma. December 16, 1977, Rodney commits a home invasion in Malibu. He strangled and used a hammer to bludgeon a 27-year-old female to death. This takes us to September 13, 1978. Rodney appears as Bachelor Number 1 on the TV show The Dating Game. He was introduced as a skydiver and photographer who rides motorcycles. So I'm a little disappointed in the research done by The Dating Game here. He used his real name. And of course, he had been on the FBI's 10 Most Wanted list, right? So it makes me wonder if they looked into his background at all. Now, a woman named Cheryl Bradshaw was the female contestant who was directing questions to the bachelors on that episode. She actually selected Rodney as the winner. She chose him to go on a date with her. She would later comment on their interaction backstage after she had selected him. She said, I started to feel ill. He was acting really creepy. I turned down his offer and I did not want to see him again. Now, bachelor number two was an actor named Jed Mills. He said that Rodney was always looking down and would not make eye contact. He also said that Rodney got in his face before the show and said, I always get the girl. Five months later, February 13, 1979, Rodney is 36 at this time. He sexually assaults and chokes a 15-year-old female. He was arrested after she escaped when he went to the bathroom in a gas station. June 14, 1979, Rodney strangles a 21-year-old female in a Burbank home invasion. June 20, 1979, 12-year-old Robin Samso goes missing. That same day, a 20-year-old firefighter saw a man dragging a female into the woods. She did not call the police. Later on, one of her co-workers would find bones in that area, and he called the police. The remains were identified as Robin Samso. July 1979, Rodney would be arrested on suspicion of murdering Robin Samso. Rodney's trial begins in March of 1980. In April, he was convicted of murder and kidnapping, and in June, he was sentenced to death. While appealing his sentence, Rodney is convicted for other crimes. Eventually, his murder conviction is overturned. He is retried for the murder of Robin Samso in April of 1981. He's found guilty the next month. He would once again be sentenced to death in June 1986. In 2001, this conviction was overturned again. He would be found guilty in 2010 for the murder of Robin Samso and four other women. In 2013, he would plead guilty to two more murders. In the end, he would be convicted of seven murders, but he was suspected of committing many more, including murders in Washington and Wyoming. Some believe he could have committed over 100 murders based on numerous photographs that he had in an album, which are still unidentified. Now moving to his mental health and personality, we see a lot of behaviors here that seem to align with primary psychopathy and a few with secondary psychopathy. Pointing toward primary psychopathy, we see that Rodney is calm after his attack on that girl in 1968. Again, he opens the door, the police are there, and he says, I'll be a moment, and he escapes. He didn't panic and try to run out the front door. He didn't look suspicious enough to where they just grabbed him right then. So we see low neuroticism here. He repeatedly fooled prison officials and mental health professionals in the criminal justice system. He had superficial charm and the ability to manipulate. He had no fear of killing a high-profile individual like Ellen Jane Hover. So again, we see fearlessness is part of low neuroticism. Rodney's deceptive repeatedly, so we see pathological lying. The way he was described by the people on the dating game gives us some indication as to what was going on. He was described as creepy, something being off. This really points to the power of intuition, right? So even though those people might not have recognized his behavior as psychopathic, they knew that something wasn't quite right. And in the case of Cheryl Bradshaw, she acted on that and did not go out with Rodney. If she had, it seems fairly likely that he would have attacked her. In the 2010 trial, we see that Rodney acts as his own attorney. He manifests a lot of unusual behavior during that trial. We see grandiosity there. He also demonstrates no remorse and he takes no responsibility for his behavior. Now looking at secondary psychopathy, we see excitement seeking. There are indications of this in his preferences. He wanted to be a paratrooper in the army. He said he liked skydiving. He liked riding motorcycles. So he's drawn to excitement. He's also impulsive and irresponsible, again consistent with secondary psychopathy, and his crimes indicate explosive rage and a need to dominate 
This is exceedingly common with serial killers, although it's not specific to one type of psychopathy or the other. So his behavior seems to align with the diagnosis he was given, antisocial personality disorder. His behavior aligns with all seven of those symptoms. Other professionals who interacted with Rodney had suspected narcissistic personality disorder. I think one could certainly make an argument for alignment between his behavior and those symptoms as well. This isn't really surprising for someone who has behavior consistent with primary psychopathy. We would actually expect there to be characteristics of narcissism. Now, what about borderline personality disorder? We see this was one diagnosis he was given. Borderline personality disorder, BPD, has symptoms like impulsivity, anger, and emotional dysregulation, which do seem to align with Rodney's behavior. But then we see other symptoms like paranoia, identity disturbance, and frantic efforts to avoid abandonment. I'm not aware of any evidence that really supports those symptoms, but the professional who diagnosed Rodney had access to more information, including the ability to interview him. Now, the last confusing issue with Rodney related to mental health is the nervous breakdown that we hear about in 1964. As I talked about in the video I did about nervous breakdowns, this term is nonspecific. It can mean a lot of different things. It can mean something like depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, personality disorders, although it has the strongest association with adjustment disorder. I find it interesting that when presented with Rodney's behavior, the Army mental health professionals decided on antisocial personality disorder. That wouldn't be the first disorder that one would associate with symptoms related to a nervous breakdown. That's usually a diagnosis that professionals are fairly careful about because there's a significant stigma associated with it even back in 1964. Because they add the terms chronic and severe, that leads me to believe they were quite convinced that he had that disorder. Could it be the term nervous breakdown was used because Rodney was psychotic? Even though he had unusual behavior, like when he represented himself at that trial, it doesn't seem like his behavior really aligns with a break from reality. So the behavior seems more aligned with personality extremes than psychosis. For the last part of this analysis of Rodney Alcala, I will offer a few thoughts about Rodney's appearance on The Dating Game. Now, there are some people who watched that episode of The Dating Game, and from that, they believe that Rodney was behaving in a manner consistent with psychopathy. But I actually think he fit in pretty well with the other people on that show, at least during the parts that were aired on television. And that's what one would expect for someone who is psychopathic. Again, superficial charm and manipulation skills. He was good at seeming outgoing, friendly, and normal for a short period of time, right? He couldn't fool the people behind the scenes, but when the camera was on him, I think he actually did a pretty good job of seeming relatively normal. The funny thing with the dating game is I think this show actually attracted a number of people who were psychopathic and narcissistic. There were only so many men and women in Southern California during that time who would fit their criteria. They had a relatively narrow age range. They were looking for people who were single, and they were looking for people who were willing to flirt and have those uncomfortable discussions on national television. It does actually seem like a recipe for attracting narcissists. In the brief amount of time I spent in Southern California during different periods in the late 70s and early to mid 80s, I was introduced to a few people that had actually been on the dating game. And I'm sure they were very nice people and everything, but at the time they struck me as highly interested in their own appearances, talkative, and extremely confident. I remember that I formed this impression that just about everybody who had ever been on that show mentioned their appearance within the first 20 seconds when they met somebody new. Almost like the phrase, I've been on the dating game, was their last name. Like, hello, I'm Steve, I've been on the dating game. That always struck me as curious. It doesn't surprise me that Rodney was offered a spot on that show. Now I know whenever I talk about topics like serial killers, there will be myriad opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.